Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the breakout called How Much Can We Expect from Nuclear Energy? I'm Rick Knight, one of CCL's three research coordinators. And today we have a fine speaker, uh, Professor Matthew Bunn, who is the James R. Schlesinger Professor of the Practice of Energy, National Security, and Foreign Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Professor Bunn will review nuclear energy's potential for helping to mitigate climate change. He's gonna answer what obstacles would have to be overcome and what risks would have to be addressed for nuclear energy to play a major role. And what can new policies or new technologies do to help deal with these constraints and risks? So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bunn and Please uh, enjoy this breakout, everyone. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, nuclear energy is, there are sort of two narratives about nuclear energy. One is it's uh, the really the only big scale, non-intermittent, readily expandable energy source we've got. It's gotta be part of the climate solution. Another narrative is it's too big, complex, expensive. Uh, it can't really grow at the scale and the pace we need to move the needle. So uh, let's talk through what some of the constraints have been. The reality is that ever since the nuclear accident at Chernobyl in 1986, uh, growth in nuclear energy has been slow. It was basically not growing at all for decades. And then in the last couple of decades, it has been growing, uh, but modestly compared to other clean energy solutions like solar or wind. Um, now, what are the key constraints? One is cost. Unlike solar and wind that have been declining very rapidly, uh, Nuclear energy has been on what I sometimes call a forgetting curve, at least in the United States, where the cost has been going uh, up and up. In some other countries, like China and South Korea, they're able to build nuclear reactors more quickly uh, and more cheaply, um, but still a uh, very significant cost uh, to nuclear energy. Secondly, there's public concerns and that makes nuclear reactors hard to site. Uh, with current types of nuclear reactors, you mainly have to put them near a big body of water. So you'll see a lot of them along coastlines, uh, on a lake, along a river. Um, and so if you look at China, for example, which is building more nuclear reactors than anyone else on Earth, um, they, ever since the Fukushima accident in 2011 in Japan, uh, China had for several years put a pause on approving any new sites and still has not approved any that are inland from the coast uh, because there you'd be using for cooling water, say the Yellow River or something like that. And you can imagine if there was an accident there, you'd be affecting millions and millions of people downstream uh, on the river. Uh, now, uh, those are the two biggest constraints, uh, sort of siting slash public acceptance, which relates, of course, to safety and security of these reactors and cost. Now, there are other risks and constraints. So there's the issue of nuclear waste that we can talk about. I would argue that uh, if handled appropriately, nuclear waste is actually quite a minor uh, hazard per kilowatt hour to either humans or the environment compared to either the other risks of nuclear energy or to other energy sources. Uh, there's uh, the risk of nuclear proliferation. I would argue the reactors themselves actually don't have that much risk of nuclear proliferation. It's mostly the fuel cycle that supports them, the uranium enrichment or the plutonium reprocessing, because those are the things that allow countries to make nuclear bomb material. So what can uh, either 
new policies or new technologies do to address some of these constraints. Uh, and we need to address them on a big scale if we're really going to move the needle on climate. Just to give you a sort of mental picture, before the Fukushima accident in Japan, the world was adding about three gigawatts of nuclear energy to the grid globally each year. In order to be maybe one-tenth of the clean energy we need by 2050, you need to be adding 30 gigawatts of nuclear to the grid every year from now until then. No way that's gonna happen in the next few years. So you're really talking about 40, 50, 60, 70 gigawatts a year uh, toward the end. So you have to convince the people who decide what kind of power plants to build that nuclear is much, much more attractive than it was before the Fukushima accident. So that's a, that's a heavy lift. So what could we do with policy or with technology? Uh, for the near term, policy is probably the biggest deal. Um, you, want, you need to have government-backed low-cost financing. Uh, whenever you have uh, an energy source like nuclear, like solar, like wind, where almost all of the cost is in building the thing in the first place, whether you're paying a lot of money per year for the money you borrow or the money that gets invested, uh, to build the thing in the first place for the capital cost or a little bit of money each year, a small percentage each year makes a huge difference in whether that energy source is profitable or not. Today, nuclear is only being built in places where for, because of government policy, you have some low financing rate. Um, there are a variety of things you can do on the regulation side uh, and so on to make it at least a little bit easier to site and build nuclear power plants without sacrificing safety or the public's voice in nuclear decisions. On the technology side, there are a bunch of advanced reactors that are promising and are worth um, you know, worth putting some research and development money into. Uh, and in both the United States and several other countries, there are advanced reactors that are either being demonstrated or planned to be demonstrated. Some of these reactors, the hope is they might be able to bring down the cost at least a little. Uh, most of them, I wouldn't expect dramatic changes in the cost structure. Some of them, the revenue might be better. So. One of the things that the company that Bill Gates is funding, TerraPower, is thinking about is storing some of the heat from reactor in a molten salt so that you can make the electricity later at some time when the electricity price is high and thereby bring in more revenue uh, for uh, your reactor. Some of them have uh, a, a simpler, more uh, passive approach to safety so you don't have to rely on pumps working at the right time or people pushing the right button at the right time. Uh, some of them uh, would be more efficient in using uranium resources or produce a smaller physical volume of nuclear waste. Um, I will say the physical volume of waste is not, it doesn't determine what the risks from bearing the nuclear waste are. It doesn't determine what the cost of bearing the nuclear waste is. Both of those things are mostly determined by the types of radioactivity that are in the waste, which don't change as dramatically from one uh, kind of reactor to another as the physical volume does. Um, so we, there are things we can do. Um, we do, there are reasons to be optimistic because we have new materials we didn't have before. We have new abilities uh, to, with computing to, to simulate nuclear reactors that we didn't have before. But there are also reasons to be pessimistic about nuclear innovation. Unlike solar, where you can make some real progress maybe on a laboratory bench scale, with nuclear, to really know whether you've made progress, you need to build a big object, which is going to you know, have costs in the billion dollar to multiple billion dollar uh, range. And so you won't get as many shots on goal, as innovators say, 
uh, as you will in other areas. Uh, and um, there's a, if you look at the history, you find company after company after company making all sorts of promises that haven't come true. And in fact, the whole what's referred to as the generation three nuclear reactors were basically a commercial failure. Only a handful of them have been built. And so we're now relying on skipping that generation and moving on uh, to the next. So the nuclear energy uh, association's own sort of stretch goal, as they describe it, is 1,000 gigawatts by uh, 2050. Uh, that would be an ambitious goal. That would be in the range of the sort of 30 gigawatts a year I've been talking about. Um, it would provide less than a tenth of the energy humankind needs in 2050. Um, and so it would be uh, significant, but not, you know, the answer. Um, so in the end, I consider myself a skeptical supporter of nuclear energy. I think it's going to be harder to mitigate climate change unless we can get a big chunk from nuclear energy. But I think it's going to be quite difficult to get a big chunk from nuclear energy. So um, I will leave it there and open it for questions so we can have some discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Bunn. And sorry about your slides, but- uh, well, I'm was, sorry was about a, my slides too. That <laughs> was a wonderful overview. Uh, let me, we've gotten some good questions already in the chat. I uh, want a question from Ed Bashor. It seems the outstanding valuable characteristic of nuclear is its capacity factor and dispatch characteristics. This implies that nuclear might be useful for some base load level with other sources like wind and solar making up the difference. Have you investigated what level of nuclear would be required to meet this base load requirement? And I think you sort of touched on that. So in the past, base load has been a, a very fundamental part of our electricity system. In a future dominated by intermittent renewables, I think what nuclear has traditionally done, which is just sort of flat, um, generating at 100% capacity for as much of the time as you possibly can is not really what we're going to need. And that's why a number of the advanced reactor developers are developing concepts where you can uh, either expand the electricity generation when the price is high, say when, the, when it's a cloudy day or what have you, and the solar isn't providing, or there's no wind, or what have you. Um, or uh, you can uh, make something else when the prices are low. You can make you know, liquid hydrogen and use that to make liquid fuels or something like that. Um, so I think we want future nuclear to be able to provide not just base load, but mm -hmm. some degree of peaking to to help back up the intermittent renewables the way gas plants do today. Uh, and I, the, some of the studies, uh, you know, people have started trying to do cost optimization studies for an overall electricity system. It seems clear that having something that's not intermittent, whether it's nuclear or something else, helps a lot and, uh, rather than trying to do it all with wind and solar. But maybe as much as you know, thirty percent of the electricity system coming from something non-intermittent mm -hmm. would be quite helpful, especially if it could also do the peaking. Yeah, very interesting. I never would have thought of nuclear as being a peaking technology. Uh, a well, question it's not that, as it exists today. Some of yeah, these advanced certainly. concepts have that potential. Uh, the question then that uh, comes to my mind is: uh, Do you see the modularization? of the smaller reactors as being a part of this, uh, this sort of strategy? So a lot of the new designs that are on the table at the moment are what are referred to as small modular reactors. So rather mm -hmm. than a giant uh, gigawatt, one and a half gigawatt plant, they're 100 megawatts, they're 300 megawatts, something like that. There's also people working on really tiny reactors that are you know, five megawatts or something like that, but those are really for niche specialty uh, mm -hmm. purposes. Um, 
these small modular reactors, um, they might be easier to finance because you're not, you know, it's you're not betting the entire company on one facility the way you are with a, right. a reactor that might cost five or ten billion dollars uh, to build. Um, and you might then, and they might fit better in the grid. You don't often need a gigawatt all at once. In particular, a lot of the coal plants that are going to be retiring over the next couple of decades are sort of in the 300 uh, megawatt class range. And so if you could replace those with clean energy systems that were also non-intermittent, like nuclear, but also like geothermal or uh, fossil fueled with carbon capture or something like that, um, you might really be have something important for the uh, reliability uh, of the grid. On the other hand, um, you know, to get the same amount of energy, you got to build a lot of them. And the reason we went to big scale is their economies of scale. And so what the small modular people are thinking is, well, we'll make up on economies of physical scale with economies of manufacturing scale. We'll build a lot of them. But to get those economies of manufacturing scale, you need a lot of contracts. And to get the contracts, you have to prove they're already cheap. So there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a couple of questions you probably would anticipate about thorium. Where does, uh, are they being de developed in the US as they are in China? And what's your view on thorium overall? So um, thorium reactors uh, are, it, it's a term that's often used to mean a particular type, molten salt reactors with thorium fuels. It's a little bit misleading because there's lots of different kinds of ways to use thorium in reactors of lots of different types. And molten salt reactors themselves can also run on uh, more traditional uranium uh, fuels. Now, thorium in and of itself is not a fuel. It's what's called a fertile material. So natural thorium, uh, thorium-232, will absorb a neutron in a reactor and turn into uranium-233, which is a very nice fuel. Now, unfortunately, so uh, to answer the question, yes, there are people working on thorium reactors. There are two or three, uh, at least, uh, of the sort of startup companies in nuclear that are working on molten salt reactors using thorium fuels. The Indians, which have in India, there are large thorium deposits. Um, and they've been uh, envisioning uh, using thorium and more traditional sodium cooled fast reactors. Um, uh, there's a, also a concept uh, from a company called Lightbridge where you'd use thorium and uranium fuels mixed together in traditional light water reactors. Uh, it helps with some aspects. The molten salt reactors in particular operate at atmospheric pressure. And so you, you wouldn't have the possibility of this big steam explosion spreading stuff all over the place the way you do mm -hmm. with a pressurized light water reactor. Um, but you're still you know, splitting the same number of atoms to get the same number, same amount of uh, electricity. And so you still have the same amount of fission products that you have to deal with in terms of nuclear waste. With the thorium fuel cycle, you don't build up what are called actinides, the plutonium, neptunium, things like that. Those can last a long time. They're not actually one of the biggest um, contributors to doses from a uh, repository if it leaks, um, but uh, they do last a long time. Uh, so you know, arguably that's an advantage. Uh, people say, oh, it couldn't make bomb material. That's unfortunately not correct. U-233 mm -hmm. is also a nice bomb material. There is a, a nasty uh, radioactive daughter product you have to deal with, but uh, that can be dealt with. So I would say they're in the mix. They're something that ought to be looked at, but they're not you know, a solution to all of the issues of nuclear energy. A uh, question from John Perona. Are you concerned about breeder reactor type problems and elevated safety concerns, as some have indicated for Terra power? So um, I think uh, Terra power in order to get, so uh, let me back up a moment and describe to the audience what the heck Terra power is. Uh, so Terra power has actually changed its approach. Uh, it's a company uh, funded by Bill Gates and others. Um, 
They originally had a concept uh, that they referred to as a traveling wave reactor. They still would like to do that someday. They have concluded they don't have the materials needed to do that now. So they are now pursuing a reactor called natrium, which is a more traditional um, sodium cooled fast reactor, but without the plutonium reprocessing that uh, uh, really creates a proliferation hazard in traditional uh, uh, sodium cooled fast reactors. Because anytime you reprocess plutonium from spent fuel, you can use that plutonium for more fuel for reactors, but you can also use it for nuclear weapons. So any country that has a reprocessing plant is basically a political decision away from making nuclear weapons. Um, so they're envisioning this fast reactor without the reprocessing and with this molten salt heat storage that I mentioned so that they could do uh, peaking power. As for safety, there have been problems with sodium cooling in the past. Sodium uh, catches fire when exposed to water or moist air. Um, they will have to make the case in order to build the demonstration plant they're hoping to build in the next few years in Wyoming, um, which they've gotten some government uh, partner money for. Uh, they'll have to make the case to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that that's adequately safe, as safe as existing reactors. Um, and I think they'll be able to make that case, would be my guess. Um, but it will be different issues than the reactors we've traditionally been dealing with. Yeah. Here's a question came in the chat that I've had myself, uh, more or less. How much of the high cost of building nuclear results from the technical challenges and how much from liability and insurance? Uh, that is well, the cost of making people feel safe. Uh, the reality is most of the cost of liability and insurance in most countries is borne by the government. Uh, so in the United States, we have what's called the Price-Anderson Act, which basically says, you know, nuclear reactor operators have to form an insurance pool to cover the first few billion of mm -hmm. damage from a nuclear accident. But beyond that, the taxpayers will take care of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason for that is the thought was that the risk of an accident is so uncertain uh, and potentially so almost unlimited that it would be very hard to buy insurance uh, for the full cost. And so the government took over the rest of the cost. Whether that's a good deal for the taxpayers or not, uh, there are lots of uh, points of view. But in any case, yeah. the real costs of nuclear reactors, uh, it's a, a little bit of a puzzle, honestly, why they have gone up uh, so much uh, as they have. Um, but uh, there, there's a lot of redundant safety measures that you've had to put in, um, partly as a result of the accidents that have occurred in the past. You probably want those redundant safety measures, but one of the things they're trying to do in the advanced systems is build them with more passive safety right. so that the safety is sort of inherent to the way the reactor operates rather than relying on, yes, we've got this pump and this generator, and then we've got a backup one in case that one fails. And then we've got another backup one in case yeah. that one fails. Um, and that passive safety approach, I would argue, also helps with security. If, it's, if you can make a reactor much more difficult to cause a big radioactive release by accident, it probably is also going to be somewhat more difficult to cause a big radioactive release on purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. if terrorists wanted to sabotage a facility or something, which is also something to worry about with nuclear energy. Okay, I'm going through other questions in the chat. Um, some of these are just comments using, uh, and things you've talked about, using nuclear to generate hydrogen and other ways of, of uh, not having to worry about the turndown issue. I, I do think, let me just comment on that for a moment, because I do think it's an important thought Today, electricity is only about a third of the energy that human beings consume. Um, it will probably get to be a bigger fraction. We'll probably electrify more things, transportation, uh, more electricity involved in heating of homes and businesses and so on. Uh, but still, if nuclear could get into some of the businesses like making liquid fuels and things like that, um, 
there's some there's some big markets there and big chunks of the energy sector um and some of the advanced uh reactor designers are are working yeah. on those ideas let me just clarify for the audience uh and in, in, in tell me if i'm wrong when uh, Dr. Bunn talks about making liquid fuel. He's not talking about radioactive uh, liquid fuel. No, 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 no. I'm talking, talking about, about you know making good old gasoline, yeah. kerosene, you know, etc. The kinds of because things like uh, jets uh, are an obvious thing that are going to be awfully hard to run on solar or batteries or something like that. Um, and so figuring out how can we make liquid fuels for things that are going to be hard to electrify. Uh, is yeah. definitely one of the agenda items for dealing with the climate challenge. Yeah, here's a question that um, I'm sure is on a lot of people's mind about the waste, waste disposal. Uh, and the questioner says, while I agree the technical and safety issues around waste are manageable, the political and public perception issues are huge. Do you have any suggestions on how to address them? Well, I will report that while we're making uh, embarrassingly little progress in the United States, that's not true in some other countries. In Finland and Sweden, for example, they have managed to cite nuclear waste repositories with the complete support of the communities where those uh, nuclear waste repositories are located. In Finland, there were two communities they were looking at, and the community that didn't get the nuclear waste repository sued. <laughs> uh, it's really an amazing uh, situation. Um, I think that uh, uh, the right way to do it is not the way the United States was doing it before, where we, in essence, had 49 states ganging up on Nevada. The right way to do it is to have a voluntary approach and a democratic approach where each community that is considered has the right to say no. And to really work over time to build trust and really listen to the community concerns. Mm -hmm. The nuclear industry is often fond of saying we need to educate the public more. And I mm -hmm. that has a, a, a sense of transmission one way. And I think mm -hmm. that's not the right answer. You need a real dialogue where you listen to the public uh, and really address the concerns that they're feeling, whether you think they're valid or not, and, and do that step by step so you're building trust over time. Mm. Sounds like we need to import some politicians from Finland, maybe. <laughs> To be That's... fair, they, they don't have the federal system that we have. So you just have the national government and the local government. You don't have the state in between. Uh... Yeah, let's see if there's anything else uh, new here. Well, um, you got a couple of questions about nuclear fusion. What do you see as uh, the prospects for getting beyond it always being 10 years away? Uh, oh, geez, I wish it was 10 years away. <laughs> oh, 30. I'm sorry. I, I misread that 30. The old that? joke on fusion is it's, it's been 50 years away for 50 years. Yeah. Um, so there has been uh, significant progress on some things like uh, really building and testing uh, superconducting magnets at the, at the force, the magnetic field strengths that you need for uh, some of these more compact uh, designs just in recent times, including here in my state of Massachusetts. Um, but if you really look at the, not just the, you know, the physics that we need to do to get a little bit of, you know, more energy than we're putting into the fusion system, but to really have the kind of energy over the sustained time that you need to actually have commercial plants hooked to the grid contributing in a significant way i i am that it that ain't going to happen on a big scale uh in the first half of the century i don't think i think yeah. i think we're looking at potentially fusion being very very important in you know toward the end of this century i i don't see it being a major part of what bends the curve in between now and 2050 Honestly, I think fission as well, if I had to guess, is gonna be more important in the second half of this century 
than in the first half. Um, I, I guess I should ask Alyssa, are we, uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, we are out of time for this session. We're, we're we're wrap it up. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll say thanks then. I, I, I could go on for another hour, but uh, uh, with this, uh, because it's a very fascinating subject. But um, I guess at this point, we'd better say thank you to Dr. Bunn. And uh, it, this was a very interesting discussion. And you answered a lot of questions that I saw in the chat uh, very well. And uh, thanks, everybody, for, for participating. And I hope you uh, learned something that was useful to you. So uh, All right. Thanks for coming, everybody. If you're interested in more uh, my uh, webpage, uh, which is one of the scholar pages at Harvard University, you can Google my name and you'll find it reasonably easily, has a lot of uh, talks, articles, etc. posted there, not only on nuclear energy, but also nuclear weapons. Okay. Thank you. And bye -bye. have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.